Hey, Drew Dixon, Chief Content Nerd at Love Thy Nerd, back with you for another episode of Humans of Gaming. And we have a very special edition of the show to share with you today. It's just me this time because I'm interviewing um, a whole bunch of amazing um, content creators, board game designers, board game designers, board game producers, um, developers, um, all kinds of people in the tabletop gaming space. Um, so we're going to hear from people from Keymaster Games, um, uh, from Funko Games. I talked to the VP of Funko Games, which was really cool. You can hear from uh, some folks that work on D&D Beyond. Um, so if you're an, a D&D uh, fan, you get to hear from some people who are doing some really creative and innovative work in that space. So um, yeah, some fantastic interviews. Uh, it was really nice to be at Gen Con and finally this year get to go to a convention. Um, just something I haven't done in a long time. You know what was really great was just having a long weekend to play a ton of board games. Like, I can't remember the last time I got to play that many games. It was probably the last time I went to Gen Con two years ago. Uh, so, yeah, it was just really, it was really lovely. I know everybody has their own opinions about safety and, and things like that with COVID, but I, I thought the convention made an effort. Um, they were very strict, strict about the mask rule, which I appreciated. Um, and so people were masked up. Uh, people were making an effort to social distance, um, so I think it was as, as safe as it could be. But it was great for my emotional, mental health um, to just hang out with friends. Got to see a bunch of friends I haven't seen in a while, got to play a lot of games, um, and just got to have a great time. But you know, honestly, really, this recording this podcast was definitely one of the highlights too. Just chatting to these amazingly creative, hardworking you want to meet some hardworking people, go talk to board game designers. Uh, they are beasts when it comes to work, their work ethic. Um, and uh, yeah, just these are super inspiring people. So I hope that you're inspired by them. I hope that maybe listening to this, uh, these interviews makes you want to go out and make something or makes you want to um, play better games with your friends. Um, I hope that listening to this podcast makes you want to go check out some of these games because I do think um, they're meaningful. They will bring joy to you and your friends in your life. Um, they'll make your life richer. Uh, so without further ado, here are my interviews from Gen Con 2021, and uh, I, I really hope you enjoy them. I am Deirdre Cross. So Deirdre, what is your role at Funko? I am a VP at Funko Games. Cool. And uh, I, I was told you you work on development quite a bit. You help you help game designers refine their ideas and that kind of things quite a bit. Yeah, I am a member of the Prospero Hall team and have been um, working with this team and making games for almost 15 years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's like uh, you're a veteran in this space then. Maybe a veteran. <laughs> I don't know. Lucky. Yeah, lucky. Yeah. How did you get into making games? Well, actually, my background is in filmmaking, oh, cool. but um, I just, I love telling stories. And creating a game is creating an entertainment experience that someone is going to take home and buy and put on their table, and it's going to entertain them for a whole evening. And if yeah. you do it right, it can entertain a family, you know, yeah. for, for years and years to come. It's a really special storytelling medium. And that's really what drew me to game making. Yeah, so you've always, it sounds like you've always been motivated by stories, but also stories that, that bring people together and common experiences. Is that fair? Yeah, I just, I think we can all remember playing the game that turned us into gamers, yeah. right? How it made you feel, mm -hmm. how electric that was, and your connection with the people at the table. And for me, I that's what really brings me to gaming, is wanting to recreate that feeling for other people and bring new people into games. Yeah. And we're so lucky with Funko Games, we get to work with so many amazing IPs and bring you know people to games through the stories that they already love. Yeah, yeah. What was the game that brought you into gaming? Now I'm curious. Oh gosh, it was a game um, invented by uh, Forest Prusan Creative, and uh, which was the Prospero Hall team, yeah. and uh, published by Mattel, called Break the Safe. Okay. And cool. it was maybe 2005 that yeah. I played this thing. My cousin saw it advertised on TV, and she bought it. And it was this game, cooperative game with a timer, 20 minutes, and you had to break into this compound, uh, nice. get yeah. the keys and get out before it blew up, quote unquote. And 
it was so much fun and we couldn't stop playing it. Yeah. And then the job came open at the studio that made it and I just flipped my bananas. I could not believe <laughs> that I might Got get to come and work with them. As quickly as yeah. You can. yeah. And they were like, and of course I put it in there. They were like, wait a minute, you've actually played this game? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's cool. And uh, so tell me a little bit about what you're showing here at Gen Con. Just, I mean, I know there's a lot, but uh, just like a quick, what, what are you excited about that Funko has out right now? Yeah, we are really excited to be showing our Rocketeer game. This is the first time people have had a chance to buy it. It comes out um, later this fall at your FLGS, and it just won Best of uh, Gen Con award. Oh, wow, cool. Yeah, so that's really great. So we're showing off the Rocketeer, and this week we announced our new game based on the Warriors, a cult yeah. classic from 1979. Warriors, come out and play. <laughs> um, <laughs> I still my, haven't seen it. I need to remedy that. It's, uh, it is really intense. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a story about gangs in New York in the late 70s. It's intense. Yeah. And the game captures all of that energy, and it'll be out um, after the new year. And oh. then um, we also announced this week our Jurassic World Legacy game. Oh, wow. by Prospero oh, yeah. Hall, which is coming out next summer. Yeah, so what are you going to be managing the park and it's getting more and more dinosaurs? Like what, can you give me a hint? I cannot give you a hint. I can't tell you anything about it other than that you should go to um, FunkoGames.com and sign up for our newsletter and you'll get all the updates as we drip them out over the next few months. Okay, I'm really, that that that, that excites me, that one. I'm, I'm curious, very curious. Well, so. we are massive fans of that whole yeah. franchise and um, it does really deep uh, dive deep into the franchise cool. and that story from yeah. top to bottom great great um, and this is probably hard to answer but I would be curious if there's like a unifying value behind the games that you make at Funko or is there something that you hope everybody who has an experience with one of your games you know that they ex what what a value they experience playing together yeah, that's a really interesting question. I don't think there's any one um, one thing that hangs them together. Other than that, at Funko, we believe everyone is a fan of something. Yeah. And so we like to create games and as a company at large, products of all sorts for the fans. And so in everything that we do, we want it to be really a celebration of that property. So when you're yeah. playing something, you know, and you're playing a game based on the Goonies, you feel like you're adventuring. You have that, you know, like you want to put the soundtrack on, you want to really immerse yeah. yourself in that yeah, moment. Right. And for us, it's really about how does the property make you feel and trying to replicate that. So if you're scared, we want you to feel scared in the game. Yeah. If you're excited, you're happy, you're laughing, That's those are all the feelings we want to translate into the tabletop experience. Great. Yeah, cool. And then the last question I like to ask people in the games industry is, why do you do this? What drives you to make games and to participate in this industry? I, I do it because I'm always chasing that feeling, that first game feeling yeah. where we all became gamers. Because I think at its heart, that's joy. And yeah. that's what keeps me getting up out of bed every morning and doing the hard work because it is work. Work yeah. takes work. And yep. to get up and get to make these games that brings so many people joy. Yeah. It is just, it's the most, um, it's the most rewarding thing you could do, I think, yeah. is to, to bring people together and make them happy. Yeah, for sure, yeah, I love it, that's great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks so much for your time, and uh, definitely encourage people to go check out your, your games. Uh, I got to work at the booth yesterday, so that was fun. Uh, help out, uh, I actually got to demo, uh, help demo uh, the Rocketeer, so I didn't realize I had one best of show, that's really cool, so congrats on that. Oh, thank you so much, I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, so I'm here with Jared. What's your last name, Jared? My last name is Wasden. And uh, what is your role at D&D Beyond? I'm a product manager over the, the site as a whole. So I own all of the interconnecting bits that make some of our most key tools that people use on the site uh, work together. Cool. Cool. And then also, uh, Patrick Backman, what do you do for D&D Beyond? A senior product manager for the characters experience. Uh, so the character sheet, the character builder, uh, my characters page, and then of course we have one side job that's the Avre Discord bot. Okay, cool. And um, for those who don't know, who are uninitiated, tell us what is D and D Beyond. Yeah, D and D Beyond is a digital tool set that accompanies people who are playing D and D at the table, and the idea is to uh, help you to 
stay in immersion, stay in the game, and we'll make it uh, very easy to find what you're looking for. Uh, if you're looking for a specific item or monster or uh, some piece of lore out of the books of D&D, and uh, then also the character sheet just makes it easy to get started. Uh, your session zero where you create your character can happen within minutes rather than hours and it can just get you into the game with your friends and right onto the adventure. That's cool. And uh, I think I've read recently, you'll, you I'm, I'll probably know this much better, the statistics and things better, better than I do, but I heard recently that Dungeons and Dragons is more popular now than ever before, is that right? Yes, I think with the rise of Critical Role on Twitch and Stranger Things introducing it uh, in a very nostalgic way, it's certainly re-entered the, the public interest over the past couple of years. Yeah. So it, the popularity is increasing for sure. Yeah, so is that? I, I guess that's kind of um, certainly part of what drives you guys to do what you do is like bringing that experience, which I think, like, I'll admit, I've tried several times to play D&D and never, like, yeah. stuck with it because it feels inaccessible in some ways like you i feel like i need i need you is what i need <laughs> yeah, you need a friend who's yeah. in in the space already right yeah. because the the barrier to entry for Dungeons and dragons is probably uh the 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 biggest slope um so first find somebody who wants to play or multiple people who want to play then somebody who knows the rules so that you can play uh dnd beyond does a really good job of uh onboarding folks a lot faster um but but yeah that's that is the the big problem to solve in our world is getting people together to start playing this game that they they're very curious about. Yeah, yeah. So, um, curious, is, like, give me some sort of examples, or maybe maybe even a story of like how you've gotten people to see how beautiful and wonderful and awesome and immersive Dungeons and Dragons can be that they didn't see before. Maybe I don't know if you have a like story in mind or. Um, well, I think it's a general story, right? The, yeah. the general story is um, today's entertainment for folks who aren't TV watchers or newspaper readers. Uh, they, they get on YouTube, they get on Twitch, and they watch these, these um, live streams of folks. And then you had this kind of like offshoot niche thing of people playing this tabletop game. And uh, Matt Mercer did a great job assembling some awesome um, voice actors. And, and they got together and something dynamic happened and it started to grow and get ridiculously large. Well, fortunately for us, um, our uh, founder uh, reached out to Matt and tagged our name along with what he's doing. Yeah. And a lot of people then from there could watch what's happening, enjoy what's happening, see the, the social that's yeah. going on between these people, not only in a game, but as friends. And be like, I want to be a part of that. And then where do I go to do that? And then they found us. And then it was easier for them to onboard. We've made a lot of brand new dungeon masters and a lot of brand new players uh, because of the accessibility of, of what we do. Yeah. I think one thing that people are really excited about, Dean Deere, what captivates them is that it does build community at the table. Uh, it's it's not just playing a video game over like um, voice chat or something like that. Of course, you can do it on Zoom. But there's something about bringing friends to the table or even people who aren't friends yet. And you have a shared experience. You're, you're in a story. You are not just watching someone else have an adventure you're having the adventure together. And I've heard of a lot of p people telling like funny stories or funny moments that happened in campaigns they've been in for years, and it's as if it happened to them. Yeah. And so they resonate with this experience. Their character has gone through this journey, and they've been on that journey too. And so that I think when people see something like Critical Role, they see not only the camaraderie of the players, but they see uh, this progression. It, it actually puts creates value in their life. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, it's just a really interesting thing. And I think people have that sense of longing. They want to go on an adventure too. And D&D yeah. uh, &D can usher you into that world. Yeah, it's a safe place to have those kinds of adventures. And I think also like gives, I think there's like, we've had a, uh, the guys from, I don't know if you've heard of Game to Grow, but we've had some, th those guys on our podcast before, and they actually use Dungeons and Dragons in like, um, kind of clinical settings where they're trying to help yeah. young people like yeah. gain some self-confidence yeah. and things like that. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw this right back over to Jared here in a second, but uh, one of our coworkers who I wish was here right now, Andrew Searles, uh, he says, you don't know somebody until you've pretended to be somebody else with them, right? Uh, so, and I love that, but what one thing that Andrew uh, and Jared did 
uh, in the Huntsville area was um, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoiler, but I'll hand it off to Jared. It's something very similar to Games to Grow. Yeah, and it has to do with folks that are on the spectrum. Oh, Go ahead, Jared. Cool. Yeah, there was a local company um, that was trying to a lot of resources for people that that are on the autistic spectrum focus on children. Uh, but they, these people eventually age out of the system, and then, then where do they go? Yeah. And one of the challenges they have is being in workplaces where they know how to interact with the workplace, but also a workplace knows how to interact with them and give them roles where they can really excel. And so this company brings people on the spectrum into the workplace. And there's been some research in the UK and other places that's starting to say that uh, role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons can take a social interaction like we're having right now and slow it down and say, what do you think the person's doing? What do you see? What do you feel? What do you sense? And for someone on the spectrum, when they kind of experience life in HD, to be able to slow it down, it really enables them to take the time to learn those skills. And they even have clinicians who are uh, who work with people on the spectrum who are also dungeon masters and they run regular campaigns and we've run some campaigns with them as well yeah. with people on the spectrum and it's just it's a really beautiful thing because it gives them confidence it gives them a chance to um, practice in social situations and so D and D as a game can actually be a really beautiful thing in helping all sorts of people yeah yeah definitely that's great um, and this is going to be probably a hard question to answer but if you had to narrow it down to one thing that you hope people gain from their experience um, using D and D Beyond, um, what would it be like? What What do you hope people, you know, what what one value do you do hope they gain from their experience using your platform? I I'll jump on that initially, and I'm sure Jared will have follow ups. But um, the the thing we want them to gain is the ability to play the game and execute the game with the least amount of blockers yeah and our tool sets remove those blockers earlier faster and cleaner so that they can concentrate on the story mm -hmm. they can concentrate on the interaction yeah. uh, between each other and and just enjoy the immersiveness of it mm -hmm. breaking immersion is like the biggest faux pas for us so anytime somebody has to look down at their computer or look down at their iPad to do the thing so that they can do the next thing we try to avoid that at all costs so our tool sets should blend into the background versus be the forefront we don't want to play D&D &D Beyond we want to play Dungeons and Dragons and D&D &D Beyond just helps us do it yeah that's great I don't actually have anything to add that is exactly right um, we want people to uh, be able to really immerse themselves into the game because the game together at the table is where community happens it's where relationships are built it's where the the adventure is had and so the tool should just be exactly that. It's yeah. just a tool to help you play the game. So yeah. we, we want you to love D&D Beyond, but we want you to really focus on the game at hand. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, one last question I like to ask people in the games industry is like, what drives you to do this kind of work? Why, why are you in the games industry? Like what motivates you? I, I think story is a really important thing to the human experience. I think uh, we, uh, every culture on the planet, uh, resonates with stories and um, we oftentimes put ourselves in the shoes of the hero and so and we're all kind of on a, a hero's journey and I think that D&D &D is a really interesting way to let someone explore deep moral choices or the experiences of others in a really safe and beautiful way and um, I just see so much value in that for creating empathy and for creating understanding and for creating compassion and, uh, and ultimately love yeah. uh, for, for others and even for your own experience. And so I think, um, yeah, I, th I think that's an important thing and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of building that. And I've been in some sessions where we come to some serious moral quandaries mm -hmm. and regardless of what happens, whether I think we make a good choice or a bad choice, when I walk away from that game, those are the ones that I remember the most. And so I think yeah. letting people have the chance to have those experiences yeah. is, what, is what drives me to okay. keep doing this work in a very safe space um i think the the so i've been in the service my whole life in service or in the service my whole life and uh i i wouldn't say the word saving babies but the phrase saving babies is what i did but yeah. it, it was it was very meaningful impactful what i used to do in my life and now that i do this 
um, the thing, the, the words that I use with my team is, I said, we may not be saving babies, guys, uh, but doggone it, we're hatching dragons, right? And um, <laughs> that's and, and that's that's the thing. We're building yeah. those awesome stories. We're building the next Gilgamesh. We're building the next, um, you know, uh, any of those large epic stories, but they're your personal epic stories and yeah. they're fun. So Gwen, where are you from? I'm from Vermont originally, and I live in New York now. Okay, cool. What part of Vermont? Um, up in the Green Mountains, out near Burlington. Okay, I've been to Stowe, so yeah, yeah. it's like 20 minutes away from where I grew up. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, tell me about Fire Tower. What makes it unique? Uh, yeah, so this is our competitive forest fire fighting game, so I think that makes it unique right there. Uh, each player is defending their fire tower in their corner of the board, and there's a fire coming from the center. Uh, you're going to defend your tower using firefighting techniques like fire building fire breaks, using airdrops of water, things like that. But the unique thing about this game is you also get to take on the role of nature. You become the wind in the flame. And you actually send the fire towards your friends in this one. Okay, nice. <laughs> so, uh, do you have an interest in firefighting, forestry? Like, what, what made you want to make a game about this? Well, um, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in the woods, and so did my partner, Sam, who's the other designer, Sam Bryant. Uh, so we both love nature, and uh, okay, so we want to burn it down. That makes no sense. <laughs> uh, over the course of making this game, though, we got really interested in forest fires. Actually, everything that is in the game itself is real, even though the premise of the game is completely absurd. So all the terms uh, used in firefighting, all the events and things like that that come up. We've met a ton of firefighters along the way that have told us, you know, they've given us input on, you know, what is really big in their career. So we've tried to add that into the game where we can. Yeah, that's great. Is this your first game? This is, yeah. This is our first game, and then we just kickstarted our expansion for it uh, last year. So that just released last month. Yeah. What's it been like to, um, you know, make your first game and actually have people love it and play it? And <laughs> what's that experience? Oh, it's been such an incredible experience. I've wanted to design games since I was a kid. I've always been making games out of anything I can. And uh, so we made this one and just like took it to the next level, you know? Like yeah. I do graphic design, so I was able to do that. And we worked with my- It's a beautiful game, by the way. Oh. So you did a lot of the, the graphic design of this? Yeah, I did the graphic design and my father is actually a fine artist. And so we collaborate on a lot of projects and we collaborated on this one. So he did all the beautiful watercolors that are included um, and I'm so proud of his work. He did an amazing job. So um, being able to work with him and then Sam's an amazing uh, designer and just like figuring out all the different parts, you know, what it's like to go to a convention, what it's like to launch a Kickstarter, what it's like to do all these different things. Um, never knew anything about it and had to start from scratch, but I'm so glad we did. And it's been, you know, like a six year process, but it's been incredible the whole time. Yeah, it's great. If you had to narrow down to one thing, what do you hope players get out of their experience? What value they get out of their experience playing Fire Tower? Okay, um, 135 fire jumps. No, I'm uh, uh, I think it's a really tactile and, and a beautiful experience. Uh, we wanted to uh, give players a really interactive game um, where they get to like do something ridiculous. They get to play, you know, they get to be nature, you know, they get to send the fire uh, across the board and then also play as for firefighters. Um, I don't know, I think that this is, uh, it's strategic, it's tactile, it's incredibly easy to learn and set up, um, a super accessible game. My favorite thing to hear is when somebody comes over and they tell me, this is my mom's favorite game because she beats me every time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's the kind of game we want to make that like anybody can play, more seasoned gamers will get a kick out of it, but somebody who's newer to games can still learn it and take it on. Yeah, great, that's cool. And uh, last question I like to ask designers is, why do you make games? What drives you to do this? I just think it's the best way to be with other people. Um, for me personally, games has been a huge way to meet people, not just being in the industry. Like you go to a board game meetup or you, you know, meet people playing a game at a convention. That's just one of the best experiences. You get to bond over a game. 
it's you know it can be just about the game it doesn't have to be about other things so it's like a really good way to be face to face with someone and ha and share a fun experience um, and then I just love playing games so if other people love that you know and I can bring some fun to their table that makes me so happy well thanks for showing me fire tower it really is I wish I wish I could show our listeners because it really is a gorgeous game uh, but we'll def definitely encourage our listeners to go check it out because it really it, it really looks great so thanks again thank you yeah. Uh, so I'm here with Jonathan Phillips Bradford, and uh, tell me about your games. Hi, I'm Jonathan Phillips Bradford, uh, designer for Panda Cult Games, and we are here at Gen Con showing off Wando, the Colts of Barnacle Bay, which is our first big title. Uh, it's selling really well. Uh, Barnacle Bay was once a peaceful fishing village until the evil cult's leader, Elder Bane, took over the town. He's used his dark magic to corrupt the inhabitants of the city. The once peaceful otter fishermen are now crab arm crazed otter grunts. We've got tentacle <laughs> bunny zealots. Fish bat casters, and worst of all, berserking bear sharks. Oh, nice. We're playing as heroes from the Wanderers Guild, working together to save Barnacle Bay. It's a one to five player, completely cooperative dungeon crawler with a choose your own adventure campaign book with over 24 scenarios already in the core box, allowing you to play multiple times over through the campaign, choosing yeah. different paths every time. Okay, nice. And then you've also got Shovel Knight yes. Dungeon Duels. Yeah, Shovel Knight Dungeon Duels is our big release here at the show, uh, flying off the shelves. Uh, Shovel Knight Dungeon Duels. Working with uh, very closely with Yacht Club Games, the designers of the video game. Are you a big fan of the game? Is oh, that I'm a huge fan of the game, so it's an absolute honor to get to work on this. Um, yeah. Dream come true completely. Um, so you reached out to them. How did that come about? Uh, yeah, so we uh, reached out to them and I called them. I was like, hey, I've kind of got. I was like, showed them what we do with Wanders. So they're impressed with Wander and Barnacle Bay, and uh, they're, they're kind of. I can almost like hear their eyes like, oh, okay, send us what you got. And uh, we made a prototype of the game in 24 hours. Oh, nice. Wow. <laughs> and shipped it out to them. And I didn't actually have any tokens at the time for, like, the coins, so I sent them a roll of pennies. Yeah. And it says, to seal in the deal, it was a roll of pennies. And uh, we played the demo over Skype, and uh, they were just, like, sold. They were just like, yeah. this is Shovel Knight on a tabletop. They were really impressed. And then throughout the entire process, I've tried to stay very closely with the design team on their yeah. end to make sure it's, everything's very true to the yeah. video game. Which is like not easy to do. I think people don't realize that it's not a, it's not a simple feat to make to bring a video game experience to the table. Yes. You know? And uh, the big big mechanic for that that really draws people in and gives that environment is the uh, side-scrolling dungeon crawler mechanic. Yeah. So on the tabletop, there's four tiles creating your TV screen. At the end of each round, one tile slides off the side of the screen. Uh, cool. Three tiles shift over, another one comes down, creating a forced progression side scroller that all the players are going to have to keep awesome. up with. That's really cool. And so once you're, you're all jumping idea. over spiked pits, beating up bad guys, digging up treasure, accidentally, quote, quote, knocking each other into spiked pits so they drop <laughs> half their treasure. Yeah. Uh, but we all have infinite lives, so we always get to come back at the beginning of the next yeah. round. And then once you get through the entire dungeon, depending on what stage you selected from the video game, you face off against one of the Order of No Quarter yeah. with a big, massive boss fight. Whichever player has the most treasure at the end is the winner. Uh, the Kickstarter went extremely well, and we're just stoked to be able to have it here at Gen Con. Uh, we have the entire Order of No Quarter, every single boss fight that's in that game, we have it in the board game. Okay. Uh, we have every single stage as a tile set in the, from, in the board game as well. That's cool. And uh, if you had to narrow it down to one thing that you hope players get out of their time playing your games, what would it be? I know it's kind of hard to say when you have made multiple games, but is there a value you kind of shoot for that you want someone to step away from the table having had a certain type of experience? So uh, there's actually, like, within design, I think there's a kind of a debate of what comes first, mechanics or, or theme. Yeah. I've always been more of story, uh, something... Uh, when, I, when I sell a game, I want to sell an experience, yeah. not a rule set. And uh, I always like when a game... You're leaving a game with what I like to call a water cooler moment. Yeah. Where you would be telling, talking to your friends, like, oh, remember that one time we were playing Barnacle Bay and we met the lady of the puddle and it, this happened and this happened. Yeah. Or the time we were playing on Shovel Knight and I knocked you in the pit and then I was going to go for the treasure, and then I fell and got, got fell into the pit, and then we all fell into the pit, and there was just like 30 gold sitting in the middle. So, just, so I want stories to happen. Yeah. Out of it. I want people to not necessarily have to have a story from reading pages in between the rule book. I want a story to happen as they're playing that yeah. just happens organically. And um, I think we've, we've done a good job at that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And this is, you said this is your, you worked for Come On before. Yes. Uh, but this is your first kind of independent. Yeah, Panda Cult Games is, is, is our, when I, when, after uh, working for Cool Money or Not about five or six years, sorry, it was a while ago. <laughs> um, yeah. 
and uh, we launched Panda Call Games, and our first title is Wander the Cult of Barnacle Bay. Then after that, we did Shovel Knight Dungeon Duels, and then after Shovel Knight Dungeon Duels, we worked with IDW Games, and we designed Ghostbusters Men in Black, Ecto Terrestrial Invasion, um, which is actually fulfilling now from the pre-orders. Um, that is an IDW's publishing. Uh, yeah. We're just the design house. Cool. And uh, coming up next is our sequel to Wander, which is La Cluck's Revenge. Oh, Ghost cool. Pirate Chicken Lord La Cluck is coming to yeah. Uncle Bay. Yeah. Um, and Ghost Pirate Monkey Grunts, Albatross Banshees, Pig Gunners, and Rhino Cannoneers. <laughs> it uh, sounds like you really like... Uh live off of that you sound like a very creative person like you love to come up with wacky <laughs> well, I try I yeah. try uh, it's, but I love building the world I love fleshing yeah. out the characters because like I said I love the story I love yeah. when you're playing and just it feels like you're part of something yeah. um, you know we, we, we're, we're here to design fun not, not like metagaming right? uh, yeah. most of our games are very family friendly we want to be able to jump in but there's also a lot of depth to the games where you have to strategize yeah. uh, Bartle Cobain for example you really have to work together or the game will win the game uh, does not need need your assistance. The game can kick your butt all on your own if you're not working together. Nice. Yeah. Um, and it's been an incredible experience. And uh, La Clux Revenge, we're hoping early next year for the Kickstarter. And uh, we'll be also have uh, reprints of all the original Barnacle Bay stuff as well. That's great. And uh, one last question I like to ask designers is, why do you do this? Why do you make games? What drives you? Ooh, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing in life. Yeah. There's truly nothing else I'd rather be doing in life. And I can't express how much of a relief it's been to be back at Gen Con. Yeah. Because um, getting people to see games and play it and just fall in love with the worlds we've created is worth all of it. The past few years not being able to see that anymore was just heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, and being able, like, it almost, I almost started to forget how much I love this. Yeah. And now getting to see people play the games and laugh and have fun out of something I created at my house, right? And just seeing it become a thing. Yeah. Um, it's all kids drawing bear shark pictures, yeah. right? Like, it was just amazing. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I just love the creative aspect of it and just the, the love of this community. Yeah, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, you know, I think safety is obviously super important, yes. but uh, I don't know, you can't put a price tag on making sure there's space for us to get together and play games. Like, I, I don't know, it's, it's been really nice. Yeah, it's been incredible yeah. just to be back here at Gen Con. Um, and I felt safe. Um, it's, yeah. feel, it's been feeling good. I've heard the vaccination numbers are actually really high in attendance. So that makes me feel That's good great. as well. Yeah. Um, and it's just been awesome. And I was worried. I was like, I didn't know if there would be a lot of attendance. And our games are flying off the shelves. And That's we're already great. looking about possibly our second print run of Shovel Knight soon. So. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like I should at least mention this because people on the podcast won't be able to see this. But you have a, a, a very uh, impressive pink and purple mohawk so uh, <laughs> yeah. well done sir thank you i've actually i was actually talking about the other night i think i've had a mohawk in my life longer than i've not had a mohawk in my life yeah oh, this nice. point. <laughs> so this is a normal for you yeah it's yeah. become like a marketing thing at this point like uh there, there was a day at last year's gen con where i actually wore a hat and people didn't know who the hell i was <laughs> where's their mohawk guy? Like, well, yeah, yeah where's he i'm like i'm talking you're like i took my hat off like scratch my like oh you're john i'm like oh thanks yeah yeah <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks just, so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you very answer. much. Yeah. I was like, I'm just a mohawk to you. Yeah, no, no, yeah. It's really, it's really good to meet you, and uh, the games look beautiful and look like a lot of fun too. So I'm definitely gonna check it out. Awesome. Thank yeah. you for coming. By. So Maddox, what's your last name? Maddox Schuler. Schuler. Cool. S H U L E R. Is that uh, German? It is. Yeah, yeah. Families. Families, German, German, Polish, Schlodinsky is the other, my mom's maiden name. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, most of the time in school, we just get Schuler. Yeah. Schuler. Like, Bueller. <laughs> All right. Yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah, they went with Maddox, which was my grandmother's uh, maiden name. And they're like, he'll probably change it because it's my middle name. Yeah. George Maddox is my <laughs> full name. I'm just coming out publicly. Because <laughs> most of the time when people find that out, they're like, what? Your name's George? And I was like, but I go by Maddox. That's but it's funny. my middle name, and then I go by that. But yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, what's your role at Keymaster? Keymaster, I'm the creative lead or director over all our projects. Um, so, overseeing the mechanics and any development there, and making sure the story, alongside those mechanics and the art and all the things components, are all talking to each other in the best way possible as yeah. we make this product. That's great. And how did you get into making games? Uh, yeah. So I love playing games. I was out in Seattle for a while, and like that was where my like gateway into games happened from playing. Dominion and Carcassonne, the typical. Yeah. Um, and then when we moved back to Georgia, where, where all our family was, we were having kiddos and stuff. I'm a, one of our friends from Seattle was like, "You got to meet Kyle Key. He's this great guy there. We, I've 
worked with him in the past and now he lives there you should hang out with him well kyle had just had his third open heart surgery oh, wow. uh yeah yeah he's That's been right. through the ringer yeah. um but going into that he was like the same thing of like games are amazing i want anybody to and everybody to play games with me and who's gonna like deny a guy going into open heart surgery hey yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i won't play a game with you or whatever <laughs> um so he like developed this heartless yeah yeah <laughs> I, I didn't know him at this point, actually, so I met him right after the surgery, but that was his, like, you know, going into games, and then go, coming out of that, um, he was like, I want to make games. I, he was already an artist illustrator, graduated with fine art, Julie, fine art degree um, from Asbury, and uh, he, so he was doing a lot of, like, illustration work um, yeah. in a bunch of different spheres, corporate environment, doing cool wraps of buildings in comic-con illustrating all the stuff there so he had this like all these great background chops and so we're both like hey i i love type and layout you love this stuff and you make games what this is awesome like we could totally make a game or whatever yeah and uh he had had a few games already made at that point um but we we started making um a smaller game it was gonna be easier to learn the hard lessons on like a small like 52 card deck versus a full-on like major board game and so we're like let's run with this first um the game mechanics will be the hard part right and it's just like the arts you know the art takes a good bit of time of getting it right for sure but like we just so underestimated how hard the mechanics can be of getting them right testing the amount of work that goes into that and so there was a good awakening and um uh, learning of that yeah but we 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 were not involved in the game industry and and probably a big way or the best way that we could have been going into our first kickstarter we were just like we love games this is a cool industry. I wasn't even a board game geek member. Yeah. Didn't like frequent the site like every day that I do now <laughs> or whatnot. But uh, just like uh, um, it is funny though, like how you can really you can be really into games and not know all that stuff exists if right. you're not like dialed into this to like where we are now, Gen Con. Yeah, you know? exactly. And yeah. so um, like Kickstarter was a very different place too in 2014. Yeah, not as many projects, and so we launched there just hoping to raise seven thousand bucks it was like this would allow us to at least like produce the game legit with the manufacturer um and it ended up raising 70 (laughs) so we're like oh my gosh control so it's a small card game and uh we put the print and play online on there just so it's like allow people to check it out and be like hey we're serious i think the art obviously helped people jump in and then the price point's low so there's like finding the right balance between like hey like I don't feel like I have to commit $50 to something that I have no clue on versus like, yeah. cool, I'll throw 15 bucks at this. I like the art. Maybe I'll like the game. Yeah. So we at least started there and that was like, cool. People jumped on board and they're like, oh, we love this. This is awesome. And so we we're like, we should make more games. So we kept putting money back into the company and not yeah. really taking any because we still had our jobs that yeah. we were doing. Um, uh, and so that was going for a while. And then we hit a point where it's like, dude, we need to like legit do this well. And so that's when Matt came on yeah. and was like, hey, here's how you run a business and a company and you pay uh-huh. yourself and stuff. Yeah. And so he's been such a big help. And at, at that same time, Parks kind of hit, which has been yeah. a game changing thing, literally, uh, for us right. um, as a company and just uh, reorienting our structure and how we can uh, do good work and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. So, yeah. yeah I think most of, no, that's, yeah. that's great. I think most of our listeners are probably familiar with Parks, but just a real quick, like, what is Parks for those who are uninitiated? Uninitiated. Yeah, for sure. Um, Parks is a game where you are taking on the role of two hikers who are going to be trekking a different trail uh, every season. And then at the end of each season, you're turning in different uh, resources or the sites you've seen that are showing that um, for these parks, um, national parks. And every park card has different needs that are kind of reminiscent of what's at that park and then it has a park fact on the bottom too just for fun or whatnot but the gameplay is like hey let's make this really fun game about hiking and then also people get to learn and see all these beautiful places around the u.s and whatnot and so that was a project that happened because the 59 parks poster project reached out to us and we're like hey we have all this art y'all want to make a game we love your games and we're like yes this sounds great (laughs) it was a fun problem to solve of like okay as a layout designer i'm like thinking okay how do we respect these posters how do we use this art in the best way with these um, mechanics so we worked with henry audubon who we had just finished space park with and was like okay let's um what's the next step here or whatnot and so we um tried a game wasn't working scrapped it made a new game which turned out to be parks and whatnot um and so that was a fun and it was it the thing about it was it was it, it felt like just like every other game we had done we were excited about it we loved the art but that one just happened to take off in a way that the yeah. other ones yeah. did. Um, and so, well, I yeah. think that game is definitely like a... It's it's mechanically very sound, and I think, you know, Henry is a, a 
meticulous designer, and so that that, shi that shines in the game. But it also, it's just it's so uh, beautiful, you know. Like not just the artwork, but the layout too. Um, I mean, I think Thank it's you. one of those games that's definitely a testament tes testament to the value of aesthetics. Um, yeah, I don't know. What, what, what are you most proud about with that project? Because it seems to have really um, grabbed a lot of gamers. People are really into it. Yeah, man. I think that. Uh so working with Henry was one, just like the mechanics and finding them along the way together was just so much fun and being like, well, this could be this. And like, yeah. just there's this, this discovery phase where it's all realized right now, obviously, but it's like, what if canteens were in the game? You could fill them with water. What could that be? And yeah. Henry like comes from a cool background of just thinking in like fantasy of like, this is like a spell in a game, like where you're yeah. giving mana to your spell or whatever, you know, yeah, sure. um, or whatnot. So it's just fun to translate those things. So there's like a lot of, I think, elements that I love there. And then just from a design standpoint, I think um, one, it's a testament to JP of how the art, he, he's the um, creative lead over at 59 Parks of how all their picture art working with so many different artists there's over 35 artists in the game um just still feel unique yeah um but that was also my goal of like how can this icon language and layout um so i probably think like the wood pieces are one of the things that like doing them with the stained details yeah. and like with the component resource trays and just hopefully how that adds to the experience and um, how those icons and colors are very intentional in all the, the poster mm -hmm. pieces and what we've chosen for that, um, how it all comes together, hopefully still like ties it all together versus yeah. it feeling like a completely different thing, like, cool, this color's coming out of nowhere or whatnot. So sure. it yeah. was a lot of work and sometimes you're just doing stuff and we're like, will anybody notice? But hopefully yeah. those like little small things all come together to make it all feel yeah, like yeah. one thing. Is there, um, like if you could point to one thing you hope people step away from one value people gain from their time playing Keymaster games, what would it be? Man, I think that, uh, yo, yeah, you can come in here. Um, I think that just sharing experiences with one another and um, looking around the table, I love that games can open up stuff, open up competitiveness in a person in a way that, yeah. that, that feels okay too. It's like, hey, we're both agreeing to this social contract of playing a game and playing it at our best, but also it kind of like takes these barriers off of um, what might be in a conversation with someone you're like oh, I'm being like too more reserved if I'm just meeting someone whereas yeah. the game's like go have fun and be crazy you know yeah. and so one I think it, like from our games from Campy that's a bit more of a crazy game to Parks and the experiences you might that might come up in the conversation starters of what you're sharing across the table yeah. um, is like where we love why we love games of yeah. like that that shared experience and then hopefully those memorable moments of like remember when i just snuck out that victory from you like right at yeah. the end or like i had these year cards and that big reveal of that sort of moments i think are what i think about when i think about people and them sharing games together yeah, yeah. Right so this is kind of related but why do you make games what drives you uh that is a great question uh i think the whole team asks that sometimes too because I can feel like I'm going to be in so many different directions of like this is really exciting or this thing's really yeah. exciting I think the idea is the biggest thing of like when I see a game um, whether it's the mechanics or an artist and being like oh my gosh this art has not been done in the game world in this way how can we uh work together with them to present something new to gamers or to people who aren't gamers yet and they might jump in because they see the art and are like I just really like this yeah. and so I think that like the gameplay is obviously I love and I really like games a lot just heavier games even too and yeah um but I think that like figuring out that sort of balance of like how do we make these almost pre like yeah very presentable package that invite someone in but kind of very slowly hold their hand to be like yeah look at this crazy experience you had and then you have this whole deeper realm of, of yeah. discoverability and things that can happen there so uh what makes me make games is like that whole idea I think of like from the concept of like this could be it to like the whole process and it is a whole crap yeah. ton of work and ups and downs and things like that mm -hmm. but it's like all worth it in the end to be like cool it all started from the seed of a uh, like how can we do this yeah. ridiculous theme in this fun way where yeah. people and then then the, the fruit in. of it yeah. yeah you have this like long waiting period of like we made it we delivered it to the manufacturers just on a boat and then people start receiving it and it's like oh they're having these great yeah. feedback and experiences and yeah. that is like oh, they yeah. take it home play with their significant other their Kids, friends or their family yeah or, exactly yeah. Um, great. yeah man that's cool man i love it well thanks maddox Dude, yeah. thank y'all so much
Krista, Scott right? Yes. Krista Zimmerman. Yes. And uh, you did, uh, you've done illustration for Orange Nebula and their Unsettled uh, expansion. What you were telling me, kind of how you got into into doing this kind of work. Yeah. So it was illustration that actually introduced me to the board game world. I love creating fantasy worlds and just creatures and all these things and it turns out that that meshes perfectly with what a lot of board game designers need in their games yeah absolutely and it, the look of unsettled is really cool it's uh it's really beautiful so you know good work <laughs> thank you and there's a lot of other artists involved it's so cool to kind of bring my own personal artistic flair and then see it alongside the styles of all these other wonderful artists yeah that's great and how long have you been uh doing this kind of work illustration and board games and stuff well, I've been an artist my whole life, and it has finally kind of turned it into this um, field within the past couple years. So. What's that transition been like? It's incredible. It's like the thing that I've always wanted to do, The even as a kid, you know, the kind of passion I find to explore and find things. It has this correlate in the world that is actually a skill that people need. Yeah, yeah. And you were telling us a little bit about the kind of the... the story of the of this of the game tell me a little bit more about that because it's kind of pr pretty gnarly pretty funny <laughs> yeah think, well funny in a way you have a dark sense of humor yeah so unsettled is a game where you your ship is pulled through a wormhole and you crash land on a planet and we have a whole bunch of different planets each one is very different and the one that i illustrated is a giant head of an alien that is floating out in space and so you're having to navigate inside and outside of that planet-sized head and all of the terrors that lie within <laughs> <laughs> that's that sounds ter uh, pretty terrifying so um yeah uh, what what do you hope players get out of their experience playing the game i i love went to feel immersed in a world and I think we can feel that in our own real world. And with this, we can explore worlds that we can only imagine. So. Yeah, that's great. And uh, another question I like to ask designers is, and, and illustrators, people in the game space, why do you make games? Why do you, why do, you do this kind of work? What, what drives you? I think it's that same kind of passion for exploration. I want to explore the real world, and then I want to synthesize that, and I want to share what I've learned from that with others. Yeah, great, great. And then uh, what's it been like for you so far at Gen Con? I know it's just the first day, but, um, you know, it's our first, feels like the first real convention after, not out, we're still in a pandemic, but, you know, in this unique period we're in what, what's it been like for you all so far well this is my very first gen con oh, okay, yeah. uh yeah so since, you don't uh, have much to compare to <laughs> yeah i joined orange nebula like right before and as the pandemic was starting and yeah. so th this is kind of my first time going with them and it is incredible and exciting and i just it's it's so cool that's great well th thanks so much for your time krista oh, thank yeah you so much. thanks I'm here with Dan Kazmaier of Steep Games. Um, tell me what you guys are showing here at Gen Con. Hey, yeah, we uh, flew down from Canada. We have uh, some dice trays that we're releasing and then uh, Chai Tea for Two, some demos. Got a bit of Chai Deluxe as well. Yeah, and you had a kind of... Something that happens at these conventions sometimes, which are like... It's super important to be able to sell stuff here because you have this captive audience of big-time gamers and you kind of had something a little bit frustrating happen. You want to tell me about that? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, we uh, had our boats show up a couple weeks ago in Long Beach, and then uh, they're supposed to arrive, you know, with our big container, 40 foot, uh, maybe like a week and a half ago, but it's stuck in Detroit. Things happen, so yeah, we're still making a lot of friends, and people love the dice trays, so yeah. all good. Yeah, yeah. I'm always surprised by when stuff like that happens. Uh, I, it would drive me nuts, but you seem to be having a really good attitude about it, so I commend you for that. Thanks. I guess you just got to make the most of it, but... That's right. Yeah, I mean, Origins, Origins is in a couple weeks, so we'll be good to go there, and we're just fulfilling our last campaign, so... Yeah. yeah you can't do it all, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about Chai and what makes it unique. Sure. Uh, I guess it's an immersive tea game. Um, we just won the World Tea Expo uh, Most Innovative Tea Company for the, the past year, so that was a super surprise. Uh, we didn't even know we were a tea company, I guess, so <laughs> all these tea shops want to pick it up and families. It's more of a gateway game, but yeah, it plays in 10 minutes per player, um, has really cool tiles, sort of like um, the ones from Azul, so yeah, we just love the components, there's little cups and whatnot, so yeah, people are really digging it. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, if you had to narrow it down to one thing, what do you hope players get out of their experience playing the game? Uh, yeah, I mean, most games are competitive, and this one is like a little bit semi-cooperative because you're trying to help each other like pick out a really cool deal in the market. You're trying to combo some different tiles together. So, yeah, I think we just envisioned um, like a game that feels friendly and warm. And I mean, there's still a winner at the end, but it just conveys like a warm cup of tea sort of thing. That's cool. And you were telling me about uh, some other projects you have coming up through the desert. Do you want to talk about that? Sure, yeah. It's uh, a little bit unreleased, but we uh, signed uh, the 25th anniversary edition for Dr. Kinesia's Through the Desert. So that's uh, yeah, a big pickup for us. Um, hopefully designing a little bit of expansions on the side, but yeah, I love a good camel game. Um, that's the one with all like, the colored pastels. It kind of looks like the rocket candies. So. Yeah, just trying to figure out how to you know introduce it to a new audience. It being a little bit older, it's kind of the precessor to Ticket to Ride. So I think yeah. people will really enjoy it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and uh, one last question I like to ask designers is, why do you make games? What drives you to do this? Sure. Um, I guess most of us have been like gamers our whole life, um, and there's like a game in every gamer. So beyond those cliches, I, I think we're just kind of like made to be creative and like express ourselves and um, yeah, just enjoy you know, playing games and being competitive. We love designing things, whether it's like uh, my wife, Connie, who co-designs, she loves uh, interior design and architecture. So games are like an expression of that. It's kind of like an interactive comic or novel. So yeah, I'm putting the, the English degree to good use. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, you've got a baby on the way, so I just wanted to say congrats. It should be oh, like any day now, right, really? Yeah, November 2nd. So uh, there's a big chart. We were trying to figure out like what, what's the percentile of it showing up um, the little guy while I'm away. It's like 2%, so we're kind of playing the odds, but we definitely won't go to Essen. Yeah. That's like a week and a half before babies do. So yeah. yeah, stoked. We got the nursery set up. People have donated tons of clothing. So we, we got a new play tester and expansion bag on the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Do you already have kids? I forget. No, we don't. And it's the first grandbaby on both sides. So okay. uh, yeah, super special. And my brother and I were both adopted. So like even including my parents in the whole birth process and, and journey of pregnancy has been really special. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. Well, congrats. Uh, the first one is always like, they're all special, but <laughs> the first one is like, it's just such a cool journey. So I'm excited Thank for you, you, man. That's cool. Cool. Well, thanks, Dan. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Jason, Jason, Mac. Mac? Yep. Okay, cool. Is this your first game? This is our first game. Cool. And uh, tell me about um, Moonshine Empire. So Moonshine Empire was a game that got born out of our want to play those heavy strategy games, but in a shorter amount of time. Both of us had kids and uh, wanted to really have that fun experience, but in a shorter time. So we created Moonshine Empire, where Pappy, who has been uh, living in the swamp and running Moonshine for decades, is ready to retire. And so you play as one of the people in the town that want to take it over for him. And so you have one night, eight rounds, to make and deliver as much Moonshine as you can to Pappy's retirement party. Do you guys, uh, you into your, your company is Barrel Aged Games, so is that an interest of y'all's? You into... Uh uh, moonshine and, and whiskey and stuff like that? We like all of that, yeah. A lot of the design of the game was done at breweries. We're from uh, Southern California, so it's a nice open space to play. And it's where we like to take games anyways. Um, and the idea of the name Barrel Age Games is actually based on the uh, want to distill the fun out of all the other games. So whether it's video games, whether it's childhood games, whether it's other types of board games, and kind of, you know, have fun with the theme and distill down the fun. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and you said you guys had a successful Kickstarter. Tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, last year um, during the pandemic, which was very scary, we launched our Kickstarter and uh, got about 10 times the amount of backers that we needed, um, which was incredible, allowed us yeah. to start the company. And uh, now we're finally able to ship Moonshine Empire to you know all the backers and get it out to the public yeah. and now. You said this is your first game, is that right? This is our yeah. first game, yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what made you want to get into making board games? Like, how did you transition into this world? So uh, Caleb, uh, my friend and other designer um, and, you know, partner in the company, we used to work together. And when we worked together, we, you know, sometimes duck out in the conference room and, uh, you know, kind of come up with other rules for games that we played. So things like Axis and Allies, we would come up with new you know, vehicles, boats, new weapons, things that would add to the game. And then that transitioned into us 
you know, creating games of our own for ourselves, And then, uh, you know, that a few years later, we made a game that we really thought was fun for everyone. And we said, why not take this to the next step and see if we can pitch it to companies? And then we said, hey, we can make our own company. And so that's kind of where it came from. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what do you hope players get out of their experience playing Moonshine Empire? Like, if you had to narrow it down to sort of like one value you hope people step away from their time playing the game what would it be uh, it's fun we we made a game that is very tactile because we want, we want people to feel like they're playing yeah. you know it's very it's there's tons of fun games i play tons of different types of games but i haven't seen enough games where people you know get to you know get their hands on pieces and move them around a board like we're playing with ninja turtles and gi joe again like you know that kind of yeah. feeling of putting something in their hands and moving them around mm -hmm. and we have a background in engineering, um, and so we kind of understand, you know, some of what it takes to make those kind of pieces, and what makes some good and what some bad. So, uh, we thought we were well fit to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, why do you make games? Like, what drives you to do this? Uh, just the, uh, uh, the experience, the path to doing it is probably our favorite part, and we love interacting with people. It's one of the most inclusive, great groups. To be around and uh you know we like bringing that to our own friend groups uh and making other friend groups so that's kind of where we really drive the the want to make games is to you know have that inclusivity for other people and bring about themes that you don't see a lot like moonshine you know there's not a lot of people making those type of games and that's kind of where we're latching on to um, I guess probably a lot of people would have been pretty, uh, I don't know what the word is, like scared or nervous about making a game in the middle of a pandemic, but it it seems to have gone really well for you, which is really cool. What what do you attribute that to? Was, was that a, a shock? That, I mean, 10 times the backers you were hoping for, that's incredible. What was that like, that experience? Yeah, absolutely. One of the, uh, you know, you started out and you don't know. Um, there's a lot of decisions that go along with it and a lot of work you do building up to it. So. What we didn't want to do is get all the way there and then stop and when do you restart? You know, the second you yeah. stop something, it's very much harder to get it going again. Yep. And so, uh, you know, it was right at the beginning. I mean, we're talking of launching this. We launched it in uh, March. So, like, this is just when things were shutting down. Yeah. People were still trying to figure everything out. Um, but we knew it was bad and we knew we were going to be, you know, stuck at home for a while. What it did for us is we were had... We were at home more. We both travel for work a lot, but we were able to be there and be there for our backers, be there to talk to people, you know, promote the game, get yeah. people into it, and be there to celebrate when it when it did well. And so that was really fun for the pandemic. And given that it's a playful theme, we were able to be playful with everyone else. And that, you know, in a time when everything was looking bad, uh, it was a nice way to, you know, have fun. Yeah, definitely, definitely. We need board games, uh, you know, I know, a lot of people had to take a break from their board gaming groups during the pandemic, and we're still in the pandemic. I think that's important for to sure. Yes, recognize, absolutely. But it's nice to see events like this happening. I know we have to be really careful, but it's nice to see people playing games together again. I'm sure you probably feel the same way. So much so, and we actually even uh, during the pandemic created a big four foot by six foot version of our game with 3D printed pieces and a big board that we printed out at Costco on like a poster material. And so we can, four foot to six foot away, we can play in a big room on a big table and have people socially distanced, even though we're still masked and you know vaccinated and things like that, but it's still nice to have that space and feel a little bit more comfortable in the room. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it was great meeting you. Yeah, thanks for Thank showing you. us the game. It was awesome. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, Anthony, you go by Tony? I go by Tony, yeah. Tony Gulati, did I say that right? Yeah, you did. Okay, awesome. And where are you from? Uh, I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Oh, so this is like your stomping grounds, basically. Yeah, we go about a two-hour drive. It's not not too bad. Yeah. Uh, so how did you get into um, into the world of, of board games, working in the world of board games? Yeah, so it's... It's kind of the story that you hear, you hear often. Um, so I designed a game. Uh, What's your game? Uh, my game's uh, Yashima, Legend of the Kami Masters, uh, published by Greenbrier Games. Okay. Um, they actually just announced a reboot of it happening here at the show. Oh, so. that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Yeah, no, I designed it with a university friend, uh, Joshua Sprung. We, he, he, he's definitely more of the mechanics and, and background of the, of the game and everything with his uh, engineer. Uh, the, we just basically started there. And then uh, over time, 
we figured out how to pitch games, how to sell games. Yeah. Like we were talking about doing it all ourselves initially and doing Kickstarter and stuff. But we found based on our schedules that we just wanted to to go the route of getting it published by another company. We found Greenbrier Games, got our game published, and I went to Gen Con with them uh, to help demo and sell the game. And shortly after, they offered me a sales position. Oh, that's cool. So um, I worked with Greenbrier for, uh, I don't know, maybe eight months to a year. And then after that, I joined the team of Arcane Wonders. Um, sold Onitama and Sheriff of Nottingham and, and different games for a, a number of years. Was with them for just under five years. And then right before the pandemic, um, at Essen, like right around the Essen time frame, I joined the, the Czech Games Edition team. So yeah, cool. um, it's, it's really crazy to think it's been about almost two years that I've been with Czech Games Edition because yeah. this is the first time I've ever been at yeah. Gen Con for them. Right. So. Yeah. How do you feel uh, coming back to Gen Con finally? Is uh, well, I mean, exciting? it's exciting. There's, there's, there's some nervousness. I yeah. mean, we all want to be safe. We've, we've spaced things out and taken as many precautions as we can. We have the hand sanitizer stands. We have uh, everything that's touched after demos and stuff. We, we have uh, sanitizer that we're wiping things down with. Um, but so, th so there's there's definitely a little bit of anxiety. We haven't sure. been around this many people for quite some time, most of us. Um, so there's that. But we this is this is our lifeblood. We love yeah. we love shows. We love seeing people play our games, seeing the enjoyment. The it's it's just really what what makes us thrive and and go day to day is really all these people and the interactions we have so yeah that's great um this may be hard to answer because you have so many different games at at, at cge um is there any kind of like uniting um value to your games or something that you hope kind of what what makes a a, a a game that you go that's that's we want that game that's a checks games edition game okay so i I'm not as involved more, as much with the, the game design uh, sure. part of the company, but I do know that one of the things, we only publish like maybe two new games a year. Um, like, uh, not including expansions, just like brand new games. And the, the reason behind that is um, they're very discerning on making sure the game is like, the, the top quality like it's bringing something new to yeah. the to the sphere or it's using things in a way that hasn't been done before um, the the Czech team is very uh, involved in with the designers themselves mm -hmm. to, to to develop the game into something that we could could publish um, yeah. it's usually a process that takes like a year or two as well so it's it's not a short process to get a game uh, published with Czech games so. yeah. cool and then last question I always like to ask people in the games industry is why do you do this why do you why do you make games why do you participate in, in a, you know work for a company that makes games what what drives you to do this work yeah so I've always been in sales um, it's kind of just been, I've been the sales guy. I've been the guy that, that sold things to people. And uh, I sold steel, I sold carts, I sold a lot of things I had no interest in. Um, and the board game industry, when it, when, it, when it presented itself that I had the opportunity to sell something that um, I enjoy, it gave a little bit more of a value to what I was doing. But also, now it's, it's not just that it's, I'm, I'm participating in making people happy. Yeah. So when we're here, when we're selling things, we're, we're, we're entertainment. We're giving people a reprieve. We're, we're saying, hey, kick your, kick your shoes off, sit back a while, have, have some fun. Um, and that, that, that's really where it is. That's whenever you, you see things like this, like I know you can't see me, but Gen Con is, we have a room with uh, a couple hundred people spread out right now. And everyone's playing games. Um, they're all enjoying themselves, having fun, learning a new a new game. And and you see the excitement, you, you hear the exclamations, and it, 
th that's really why, why we yeah. do it. So. That's great. Good to meet you, Tony. Thanks. Pleasure. Hey, thanks so much for listening to Humans of Gaming and for following what we do. I love thy nerd. Um, if you don't know by now, uh, we have a website, lovethynerd.com. Really encourage you to go check it out. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Uh, we're, we have a great community on Facebook, the Love Thy Nerd community. We have a Discord. Um, these are all places that you can go if you want to connect with more nerds and, and follow what we're doing. And a really big, really important thing that we're doing this fall is LTNCon. So LTNCon is coming up super soon, um, next month. So it is, uh, uh, gosh, it is October 15th through 17th. So less than a month away. That's coming up really fast. So go check it out. The cool thing about it is you can register online for free. Just go to lovethynerd.com slash LTNCon. Lovethynerd.com slash LTNCon is totally free. You can also host your own LAN party if you want to host some friends over to have your own little more uh, personal gathering. But LTNCon is online and in person, uh, but primarily online. So totally free to, to register. You can donate to us as you, as you register if you would like to, and you get some, some cool swag, uh, some cooler swag if you do that. So um, yeah, uh, check us out and uh, consider um, hanging out with us here in a couple weeks at LTNCon. Uh, thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.